Hello, I'm Glitch the Box Links, and today I'm featuring an out of the box challenge on a game from my childhood Pokemon Stadium 2. As the sequel to the original Pokemon Stadium, number 2 offers a set of rental Pokemon that you can use to fight in the Johto and Kanto gyms, as well as cups featuring 8 trainers each. Instead of rentals, you could connect the Gen 1 and 2 Pokemon games via a transfer pack to use your own Pokemon in their place. Which would be a recommendation since the in-game rentals are known to be quite bad, and beating the game with them is already a challenge. So I decided to go much further and create a challenge that would be inhumane to make someone suffer through. A run I am labeling Pokemon Stadium 2 except I'm weak. The rules of this run at their core are simple. Only use rentals and use Pokemon that are a bad matchup to the opponent. However, due to the way the game is structured, it means applying them is a bit different depending on the scenario. I'll list the comprehensive list on screen here if you want to pause, but I'll also explain each as we need to apply them. So, let me take you through the culmination of this run, which took me over two years and my journey through the most brutal challenge I've done to date. The main screen of Stadium 2 gives us two options to start with, and my first poison was the gyms. The gyms have pretty straightforward rules. I can use any rental so long as it is weak to the gym leader's typing. Faulkner is the first gym leader, and his primary typing is flying Pokemon. This means I can choose any rental that is a grass, fighting, or bug type. One quick clarification on the weakness rule. Some Pokemon like Fortress have the bug typing, but due to their secondary type it means that flying is not actually super effective versus it. To keep in spirit of the core idea, any Pokemon we choose has to actually be weak to the gym's typing. So Pokemon like Fortress, which would give us a sneaky way around this rule, are off limits. Scanning through the Pokemon I could choose from, there were definitely limitations, but Machamp stood as a good fit. It had Thunder Punch, which would be super effective versus flying, and although it would be slower than Faulkner's birds, it should be bulky enough to take a few hits. I added some more mons that seemed promising to the team and begun my first battle. Most gyms have a trainer or two before you fight the gym leader, and in Faulkner's case, this one only brought flying Pokemon. My initial assumption about Machamp being decently bulky was true, and he managed to pick up the KO on all three of this trainer's Pokemon. With the trainer down, I was able to go straight into battle with Faulkner. Faulkner's Pokemon were definitely stronger than the one before, and after losing a few battles, I whittled down which Pokemon could be beneficial from the ones I had available. Yanma, Machamp, and Hitmonchan turned out to work really well for this gym. Yanma had Double Team, and the opponent can't take down what they can't hit. It also has Swagger, which combined with Double Team meant I had a pretty good chance of getting a free turn. Between being evasive and Machamp and Hitmonchan both having a move that's super effective against flying, Faulkner went down after a few attempts. And the Azalea gem is Bugsy. Their typing is Bug, which means I've got access to Grass, Psychic, and Dark. Psychic has a particularly good Pokemon, especially for earlier gens. Alakazam, who has a very high speed and special stat, making this one look like an easy win. However, this is where the rentals in Stadium 2 kind of hinder us. Alakazam is strong, don't get me wrong, but instead of having access to really good movesets, we're stuck with what the rentals give us. Alakazam has Psybeam, Thief, Futricide, and Kinesis, which isn't the worst moveset of the game, but it's definitely not optimal when we could have had something like Psychic. Considering that Psybeam can't even KO a Rattata or Paris, we certainly can't rely solely on the mons with the highest stats. Luckily for this gym, there's a lot of strong Pokemon within our existing restriction. There are two trainers before Bugsy, and they're pretty much a pushover. Bugsy, on the other hand, has decently strong Pokemon, and the trade-off for us having good offense is that most of our mons can't take many hits. And that was really the main issue with Bugsy. I actually wound up bringing Alakazam and his previous evolution Kadabra since it had access to Psychic. You can tell the movesets are bad when the unevolved form does more damage than its evolved form. Pairing those two with the bulkier third member allowed me to claim badge number two. Things were selling smoothly until I hit Whitney. She was notorious in Gen 2 for her Miltank's rollout, but our first problem is actually with our roll set. You see, Normal has nothing it's super effective against, so I decided on using Ghost types for this gym. See, Ghost and Normal are immune to each other, so I'd have no direct advantage. Additionally, there's only four of them that you can choose. Ghastly, Haunter, Gengar, and Mistrevis. As with the other gems, the first two trainers were a bit of a breeze, though they did prove more challenging than in previous gems. Whitney, on the other hand, was an absolute nightmare. Out of the ghosts we have available, three of them also have the poison type, which just happens to make them weak to Whitney's mill tank since it has access to Earthquake. Additionally, most of our moves don't deal much damage to her Pokemon either because they aren't very strong moves, and because she tends to use Pokemon that are very specially bulky. Oh, 
and as if this wasn't bad enough. Something I didn't mention earlier is that every time you lose, you need to refight every trainer leading up to the gym leader, as there's no continue in the gyms, meaning I spent a significant amount of time just fighting the trainers again after getting destroyed by Whitney over and over. There was a solution though. Haunter has Destiny Bond, and if you play your cards right, you can take one Pokemon down for free with it. Past that, I resorted to sleep and attempting to hit Thunders. And after about seven hours, Whitney finally went down. Gym 4 is Morty, and while Ghost is weak to itself, I decided to go for Psychic types for this gym due to it having a stronger disadvantage. Overall, this gym is pretty simple. I ran Slowking and Slowbro for their bulk and Alakazam for his strength and speed. The only notable strategy is that you want to hit the Gengar with either Slowking or Slowbro before you swap an Alakazam, since Gengar can one-shot Alakazam while the opposite is definitely not true. Halfway through Johto and we run into Chuck. He limits my types to Dark, Still, Ice, and Normal. In the gym so far, the trainers before the leader haven't really posed a problem, but the one before Chuck definitely does. See, he mostly has moves that are insta-kill moves like Horn Drill and Fissure, and since they're fairly bulky Pokemon, they're pretty difficult to take down in a single hit, meaning that every time we need to retry Chuck, this trainer mostly comes down to lock on whether he hits those moves or not. Chuck himself is also quite strong, as his Pokemon get a lot of strong moves and have pretty good stats. For Chuck, I highly suggest Snorlax. It's pretty bulky and had access to Curse, which can help it tank the opposing Pokemon. In general, the bulkier the better, so I went for Steelix and Cloyster in my other slots. Snorlax was able to take two of Chuck's Pokemon down since it deals quite a large amount of damage after being boosted by Curse. Cloyster was able to deal with Machoke since it had good physical defense and hits special, which Chuck isn't bulky against. After I had figured out a team, honestly this one wasn't too difficult besides the trainer. Jasmine, however, is an entirely different story. Honestly, for a few weeks I really thought this one was impossible. We actually get access to decent Pokemon with the Ice and Rock typings, but Jasmine is just very strong versus both of them. Additionally, Fortress was a wall I could not get past, and never did. The strategy for this one is to rely on luck. Literally. I never found a consistent way through, but I opted for taking Pokemon that carried Ice moves that could freeze their target. In my successful attempt at this gym, I got three separate freezes and still came down to my last Pokemon. Articuno was pretty solid here, and so was Jinx, but the third slot should be something bulky so you can swap back when either of them are in danger. The other key to victory is to retry until she picks a team without Fortress. If she has Fortress, then restart. It's just not worth the time. Even though there's no trainers on this one, it still took me over a month to clear it. Whitney wasn't our only exception to the rules, as Team Rocket interrupts after Gym 6. The ruling I used for trainers and scenarios that didn't have specific types was to run not fully evolved Pokemon, meaning it had to have an evolution in Gen 2 specifically, not in newer gens, and I had to pick one Pokemon week to each slot of the final trainer. I wound up with Kadabra, Pupitar, Haunter, Graveler, Staryu, and Remoraid. Honestly, this section wasn't too difficult, so I won't talk about it. But I will say that trudging back through three trainers with unevolved Pokemon every time you lose really sucked. Gym number seven appeared tough at first, but there's a Pokemon that trivializes this one. Lead with Fero or something that's faster, as he'll likely lead Jinx. As long as your first two Pokemon break through Jinx, the rest is sealed when Tangela comes out. Pop a Sleep Powder off, then click Growth a couple of times. With the boosted special and healing from its Giga Drain, the rest of Prize's team should fall easily. This is the point where this run becomes a true challenge, though. When I originally streamed this run, this gym was so difficult that instead of using only Pokemon weak to the Dragon type, I actually laxed the rules to allow Pokemon to get the Dragon type when they Mega Evolved. However, during the writing of this video, I just simply couldn't allow myself to let that slide. Let me be clear. Even allowing myself the Mega Evolve exception to use more Pokemon than just the four Dragons that exist in Gen 2, I still required over three months of retries, and even then didn't have a consistent strategy for Claire. But I wasn't satisfied with making an exception for one gym. So I sat down off stream and formulated a way to beat Claire with only the four dragons in game. The trainers leading up to Claire are pretty easy to take down with Dragonite, but Claire has a better version of everything you have access to. And there's no real potential cheese like Destiny Bond. While Dratini is the weakest of all three stat-wise, it's crucial to the only winning strategy I've found. Lead with Dratini and hope for Claire to lead Kingdra. If not, restart back through all the trainers. Immediately set up Paralysis via Thunder Wave, and Dratini should survive a single hit. 
Since paralysis lowers speed, Dratini should be able to get off an outrage and some damage before going down. Everything after that is a bit of a wild card, but ideally you'll get a free turn and be able to KO with Dragonair without taking damage. The idea is to save Kingdra for the last Pokemon, and in a scenario like Dragonair vs Dragonair, you should set Paralysis to hopefully save HP with Kingdra. On the only successful attempt I had, I got extremely lucky and the Dragonair KO'd itself from Confusion, which it got from Outrage. Arcanine was the last Pokemon, but depending on what's in the back, you may still have a loss. There's a lot of Pokemon on Clara's team that Kingdra can't 1v1, but since we have access to Waterfall, it does take down Arcanine fairly easily. Claire took as many hours to take down as some of my other challenge runs in their entirety. But that wasn't even the worst part of this run, that's still yet to come. The 8th Gym Badge unlocks the Elite Four, and yet another thing that needs specification on our rules. I could take one Pokemon week to all of Lance's team, but I decided to choose one week to each member of the Elite Four, and for the 6th slot I'd have a free choice. Just like with Team Rocket, all choices have to be unevolved in this generation. And just like the gyms, if you lose at any point, you need to restart the whole Elite Four. But unlike the gyms, each member is actually quite difficult. I wound up with a team of Haunter, Bayleaf, Graveler, Kadabra, Dragonair, and Houndour. After my first attempt, it became very apparent that I'd need a strat for each one as they all had better stats and better moves than what are available via the rentals. For Will, I mostly relied on Houndour. Since Dark could deal well with his team, I tried to preserve health anywhere I could. Though most of his team could one-shot Houndour, so I swapped in only when it was safe. Koga was probably the easiest. You see, he always clicks double team, and Kadabra literally sweeps his whole team. Bruno stopped around 60% of my attempts. His Pokemon are really bulky and deal a lot of damage to everyone on my team. After some formulating, I realized that using Reflect with Kadabra would help me a bunch here, even if it cost me my sweeper. See, despite being unevolved, Bayleaf is really bulky versus his team, and that bulk has only increased when behind Reflect, letting it sweep his whole team with Razor Leaf. The final Elite Four member is Karen, and actually, she's not that difficult. After my first attempt, I learned that she would go for Confuse Ray and Attract as long as you aren't under the effects of either. So I abused this by continually swapping until each move ran out of power points. Once through Umbion, the rest of the team could be taken down pretty easily with Houndour, Graveler, and Kadabra. Out of all my attempts, I only made it to Lance about 5% of the time, which is only worsened by the fact that all of his Pokemon absolutely destroyed me. The easiest method to deal with this fight is to rely on Destiny Bond to take down a Pokemon and then Explosion to take out another. Typically you want to take out the worst two, which in my win was Tyranitar and Dragonite. Kadabra was my third choice of Pokemon, since it had Thunder Punch to deal with Gyarados and can outspeed Dragonite, who unfortunately can survive a single Explosion. After Kadabra finished off Dragonite and one-shot Gyarados, I had taken down the Elite Four, and with it the Johto Gym Challenge. But I hope you didn't think that was the end of the gyms. Once you beat Johto, you unlock Kanto, where there's eight more gym leaders to beat. Luckily, the Kanto gyms didn't have any trainers though, meaning retries would be significantly less painful. Brock allows us to use four types, and honestly, he's quite easy. My suggestion is to go Magmar, Cloister, and Yanma. These three give you pretty good coverage across his whole team, and with that he shouldn't prove very challenging. The next Dash companion we fight is Misty, who, unlike Brock, actually poses some threat to us. Shuckle is my suggested lead here. If you find something like Poliwhirl using Rain Dance, you can just click Sandstorm and chip it down until it gets KO'd. Starmie is one of the largest issues for this team, and a lot of the mods we can use get KO'd by it in one shot. Nidoking can survive, and if you're lucky you can hit a Thunder. I'm not sure why, but typically when I hit Thunder in this game, it almost always paralyzes, and this basically won the battle for me. Though if you do get pushed to Diglett like I did, you can always YOLO some fissures and play a game of who can win the RNG rolls. Lieutenant Surge was a significant struggle since I was limited to water and flying. This one took me a few streams to beat as his Raichu kept one-shotting most of my team, and it was faster than pretty much everything I had access to. A Pokemon we've used a couple of times already though wound up being the answer. Lead with Blastoise and start mudslapping whatever comes out. The accuracy drops probably won't save Blastoise, but it will allow us to set up. You don't want to KO whatever the first Pokemon is, you only want the accuracy drops. Then let Yama come in. Yanma, as it turns out, is an absolute star in this run. The ability to set up six double teams, have a high speed stat, and get access to Swagger makes dealing with Surge possible. 
Just keep applying swagger and sweep his whole team with your little dragonfly friend. Erika is next in one of the underwhelming fights of Kanto. I opted for Politoed for Parish Song to help deal with Vaporeon, which was honestly the hardest thing on her team to deal with, and then Kingler and Slowking for anything else you might find. Janine I took down on my first try. She almost always goes for status moves, so you have time to set up things like Leech Seed or Sleep, and it lets you sweep her whole team pretty easily. The true challenge of Kanto is Sabrina. Alakazam is a strong Pokemon even to this day, but was particularly strong in Gen 1 and 2. I had to try almost every Pokemon available to me to find something that could live a hit from Alakazam, since with our type restrictions, nothing I had access to could outspeed him. As it turns out, Muk can live a hit, and causes her to opt for Future Sight on turn 1, giving us a chance to set up Poison and KO on turn 2. Poor Slowbro, just don't deal with it. Destiny bond with Haunter and ignore it because it's way too bulky to try to take down normally. In the back is kind of a coin toss as to what I'll choose, but Horn Drill will make quick work of anything that's left. Two more left in Kanto, so let's tackle Blaine. Since we get access to Yanma again, I certainly intended to sweep with Yanma. I didn't really find a good way to get set up here and can't offer you much of a strategy. Because in my attempt, something really odd happened. I got down to low health with Jumplup, and he just started swapping his whole team, letting me set paralysis on everything. He swapped so many times, I really don't know what he was doing here. But, since everything was paralyzed, I was finally able to set up with Yanma and start swaggering everything. With plus 6 evasion and everything having confusion, there wasn't really anything he could do to take me down, so I swept his whole team with Yanma. For Gem 8 and Blue, we're back to unevolved and one week to each on his team. His team looked quite tough, but I was pretty close to taking him down even on my first try. Haunter, Houndour, and Coughing are my recommendations for this one. Houndour lets you swap into Alexam if needed to prevent him from sweeping you. Coughing and Haunter are a free KO between Explosion and Destiny Bond. With the gems down, we built up to fight Red, who's even stronger on paper than the other ones. That is, until you Destiny Bond and cheese a Mon with Fissure. I was kind of relieved to take this one down on my first try since I'd spent almost an entire year on this run. Finally, I could call this video complete. Oh, wait. You want the cups? I was hoping you'd forget about the cups. Fine, let's tackle the cups. The next leg of the run was something I heavily underestimated. If the gems weren't enough of a challenge, I guarantee you the next bit will be. When you enter the cups, you're given a choice of four formats, and I've got a slightly different ruling for each to keep them in the spirit of the run. I'm going to present them to you in a different order than I completed them since I skipped around between them a bit instead of clearing all of one before continuing to the next. I'll start off with Challenge Cup in case anyone actually wants to suffer through this run. It's the least painful of the four, and the ruling is quite easy. You're given six random Pokemon, and for this cup, we'll choose the three with the lowest stat totals out of the ones we're given. Since Challenge Cup isn't particularly interesting, I'll skip over this one a bit. There's four different difficulties, and since nothing is in our control, it's mostly a matter of whether you get good generated Pokemon, and the opponent gets poorly generated ones. One thing I can suggest a note from my runs of this cup is that you should know to memorize the speed stats of your three restricted mons, and try to really plan out each battle before, as while you do have continues unlike the gyms, you do have to earn them. Continues in Cups requires you to beat a trainer without any of your Pokemon fainting. Pokey, Great Ball, and Ultra Ball I swept through in my first try, but Master Ball did take a few reattempts, though no particular fight was super interesting. One general tip is that you can restart these until you get a set of three that has decent movesets and type diversity. But other than that, I can just wish you good luck. The next cup I'll go over is Pokecup, which also has four difficulties. Since this cup has eight trainers, I'll use a similar rolling to some of the earlier gems. I can only use not fully evolved. However, for cups, I'll go one step further and require the base form to be taken. This means for an evolution line like Alakazam, I have to use the lowest evolution, namely Abra, making the middle form off limits. I changed my team slightly between each difficulty, but overall, I think my final set was the best, and you could probably use it for all four difficulties. I won't talk about each trainer since a large portion of them were a breeze, but I'll mention the ones that caused me trouble. In Pokeball Pokecup, Trainer 7 was a bit tough to deal with, especially if Tauros is chosen. However, if you set up Rain with Chinchou and Thunder, it should carry you mostly through. The rest of the first difficulty I beat first try and even came out of the cup with four continues. On Great Ball, I actually struggled with Trainer 5, Molly, quite a bit. 
I just didn't really have many good typings versus her team, and if I had to redo, I'd probably opt for coughing and rely on Explosion to take out Mantine here. None of the Pokemon I brought could really deal with it, and I wound up winning this fight because I got a lucky freeze on it with Ice Punch from Abra, who wound up sweeping the rest of her team afterwards. Ultra Ball was definitely harder than the two previous ones, and I started relying a lot on Swagger and Attract with Abra. This combo makes it very difficult for the opponent to attack, and because it was fast, I could set it up in most scenarios. Also useful was recovery on Oddish and Staryu via Moonlight and Recover. Houndour also made a solid Pokemon, as it could usually survive a single hit, and his typing made it invalidate some trainers entirely. The last two trainers took a retry review, but I kinda cheesed them a bit by using Coughing to take down whatever the worst Pokemon was for each, namely Vaporeon and Arcanine. With Ultra Ball down, only one more round of Pokecup was left, and that was Master Ball. For the last one, I swapped one Pokemon for Pineco to get another option for Explosion. This difficulty was definitely harder than the rest, as I struggled even with the first trainer. I wound up not using cheese tactics for this trainer since they clicked attract a lot, and I just tried to pick whatever would deal the most damage instead. This one comes down to a bit of luck since losing a turn or two will almost definitely cause you to lose the overall fight. The next few trainers went by pretty well, though one thing to note is that if a Pokemon has Dig, you can bait it with Houndour or Coughing, then swap to Diglett for double damage on Earthquake. Trainer 7 was an issue though, and having to restart the whole cup after getting this far was a large pain. For Baxter, I had to resort to bringing both Coughing and Pineco to deal with his bulky Pokemon, and then hoping for a good matchup with whatever was in the back, as well as not missing Thunder or Hydro Pump with Staryu. I seriously lost this battle a significant amount of times and nearly got stuck until getting a really lucky play. But of course, there was one more trainer here. Trainer number 8, Pedro. His team looked terrible on paper, and he was a pain to fight as well. Tyranitar and Machamp were the issues as I couldn't take them down in one hit consistently. The one key that really helped here was realizing that Thunder would hit Charizard when it used Fly so I could get one free KO. After that, it was a matter of trying to tank enough damage to make it through the other two. The only time I got lucky enough to make it through this fight was the one time that Tyranitar managed to take itself down with confusion. That was Pokecup done, but that certainly wasn't the end. Next, I'll go over Prime Cup since the rolls are the same as with Pokecup. The first two trainers were kind of a pushover, but the Bird Keeper I had a lot of trouble with. I recommend Abra, Chinchou, and something else for this one. I ran Ghastly, but it honestly kept getting KO'd. The Swagger Confusion was nice and helped carry me through, but Ice Punch dealt a lot from Abra to some of the team. Chinchou was strong versus almost everything they brought, but they knew a lot of ground moves like Earthquake and Dig, and subsequently happened to outspeed Chinchou. I think this one mostly comes down to luck with getting Confusion, but I do have one strategy, which is to try to get all of your KOs with Abra. When you would lose Abra or Chinchou, swap back to your third member, who is mostly there to soak up damage in an event that you need to save either if the opponent pulls out a bad matchup. For Aerodactyl specifically, Chinchou can't 1v1 it, so get as much damage as you can with Chinchou before finishing it off with Abra. Trainer 5 also I didn't really come up with a strategy for, and mostly won out of luck in an attempt where he got hit in confusion, four turns in a row across two of his Pokemon. I breezed through the next two, and then landed at Marty, where I fissure KO'd his Mew and then cleaned up Ursaring and Umbreon with Mankey. So far, so good. One last cup and then we can be done. Little cup. Alright, so how does the rolling work on this one? Since everything is already unevolved, the way I thought to make this one fair was to sum up the stats of every rental available and use roughly the lowest quarter of all Pokemon available. This puts our options at any Pokemon with 69 or less stat points. This actually gives us 25 to choose from, and you can see the sum totals of all Pokemon on this sheet I put together. So that doesn't sound so bad, right? Wrong. I spent an enormous amount of time trying this cup, and got absolutely destroyed for months, over and over and over. I can't tell you how many retries or how much time I spent on this cup, because my disk space actually filled up on a 2 terabyte and I had to delete multiple recordings to be able to record new attempts. And, after coming so far, I gave up. My soul was crushed, and I could not beat this cup no matter how hard I tried. So I stopped streaming this run. Until a year later, where my stubbornness kicked back in, and I refused to lose. Before I go any further, let me say that if you want to attempt this run, you should allow yourself to use more Pokemon and kick that stat max up over 70, something like 73. One last thing before I get into how I finally conquered this cup, is that there exists a glitch to allow you to continue infinitely. I only resorted to this after 30 streams of Little Cup, 
but I highly recommend you do this starting with your first attempt. For my run, there were two berries that mattered who they were on, which is Bitterberry Radita and Berry Merrill. I'll get to these when we need them and elaborate more. This team was the most optimal I could find with my restrictions, but if you could find a more optimal one, I would love to see it in the comments below. For the first trainer, it is very important you get a continue here. You will most likely not be able to get a continue on any other trainer in the cup. See, originally I was trying this without the glitch, but if you're using infinite continue, you need to have at least one continue on the cup you're trying. I'll link a guide in the description if you're interested in how it works. Trainer 1 should be taken down in most cases by Meryl, Diglett, and Hoppip. There are very few scenarios you can't get a continue on Trainer 1, but make sure to keep your Pokemon alive. And if they go down, just restart, it's much easier than anything else. Trainer 2 is where we start having issues. Their Pokemon are generally faster than ours, and we can't one-hit KO any of them. I had Barry on Meryl so I could try to get a KO or two from Rollout, keeping it alive even when it would take a lot of damage from things like Thunder Punch. I kept Nidoran in the back as well since I had Double Kick and this trainer has normal types, but generally speaking, they could take down my Nidoran pretty easily. Trainer 3 seemed really difficult at first. The Pokemon have Swagger and Confuse Rate, and generally Chen Chao of theirs is really difficult to take down for any of our Pokemon. But, if you put Bitterberry on Radita, who happens to outspeed most of their team, and get a boost from Swagger, you should clean this trainer up on pretty much every attempt. Trainer 4 is particularly weak to Meryl and Nidoran, but Spearow usually wound up being good here as well since they normally brought Spinarak. They can take down your whole team if you're not careful, so make sure to swap when you're at a disadvantage, and try not to click Rollout on Meryl. Trainer 5 is generally mowed through with Diglett and Radita pretty easily. Alright, alright, this isn't so bad I hear you say. That's alright, because Trainer 6 routinely stopped my attempts. Dratini turned out to be pretty difficult to take down. I eventually found out that Reddit was my best matchup here, but I had to be really careful with how much damage I took. This trainer can really mow your whole team down easily. I recommend Hopip, Radita, and Meryl for this one. Hopip is in here specifically for Wooper and Kabuto, while Meryl is mostly meant to be a pivot to tank damage if needed. I've got good news, and I've got bad news. The good news is that 75% of the cup was doable, even though Trainer 6 does end around 70% of your attempts. The bad news is that Trainer 7 will end around 95% of your attempts. Scyther is an absolute menace, and swapping in on it is basically asking to be KO'd. The only good matchup versus Scyther is Meryl if you happen to both swap in at the same time. Two turns of rollout will take it out, and if you're running Barra, you're just tanky enough to live two hits. However, if they brought Elekid, sometimes they'll swap back to it, which means Meryl will go down without taking out Scyther. The strategy here is to get them to swap into Elekid, then swap to Diglett. This forces them to swap back to Scyther, and you should immediately swap back to Meryl instead of attacking with Diglett. If you found a 4-leaf Clover today and have extremely good luck, you'll pick up a KO on Scyther without them swapping back to Elekid. Unfortunately, even with Diglett and Radita left in the back, it still took quite a few retries to pick up the win on attempts where Scyther went down, since the other two could take you down fairly easily even without Scyther. So that was definitely bad news. But the worst news is finally here. By my napkin math, Trainer 8 has about a 0.1% chance of getting a win on. This fight was the fight that drove me to use Infinite Continue instead of relying on the continues I picked up throughout the rest of the cup. It was already rare I made it this far, but losing to Trainer 8 after multiple hours of just trying to get a single attempt that made it to this one was truly soul crushing. The even worse news is that depending on what they bring and what RNG luck you have, you just auto lose with zero options to win. The strategy for this one is very specific, and I never found another option leading to a victory. Lead with Nidoran and expect them to lead Chansey. If they didn't, restart. They should swap back to Ghastly next, and you can predict this and swap into Diglett. With a little luck, you can one-hit Ghastly, or if you have absolutely insanely bad luck like I do, you can two-hit KO him if you manage to get past the confusion he sets. Once you're through Ghastly, click Sand Attack on Chansey. You want to lower its accuracy as much as possible. Ideally, you'd get off at least three sand attacks here, but if you can get more, that's even better. If you don't get at least two, then you've probably lost unless your luck is beyond insane. Once Diglett goes down, bring Nidoran in and take Chansey down to just slightly under half its health. And it's important that Chansey keeps over 10 HP because otherwise, you will not win. Once you've got the HP down, just growl and allow Nidoran to go down. Meryl should be the last thing in the bag. Click Rollout and pray to the RNG gods that Chansey misses the three thunders that it will most certainly click against you. It is critical that you get at least three rollouts here, as if you only get two you will not KO the next Pokemon. 
Assuming you've made it through, there is still a chance that Abra will one-shot you with Psychic. But, if they low roll, you'll be able to live and KO them with Grillout. And with that, Little Cup in Stadium 2 is finally... Oh, you have got to be kidding me. Once you've beaten the Cups and the Gems, the Champion will unlock, and this is the final battle of the run. He's only got three Pokemon, and you're allowed to bring a whole team of six to beat him. Hey, that shouldn't be so bad, right? I ruled that I need to choose first stage Pokemon that aren't fully evolved, and bring two that are weak to each of his teams since we get double the Pokemon. I mean, we have a full team of six, this really shouldn't be that bad. <laughs> nope. He can one-shot every Pokemon on your team, depending on which Legendary is out. The whole type weakness thing was what proved to be the bane here. But, after Little Cup and being so close to finishing this one, I was definitely not about to step down. The six I chose are kinda non-negotiable to my knowledge, as with these restrictions I don't think there's another winning team. Lead with Pineco and retry until you get a Mewtwo lead. Use Explosion immediately, as you'll barely live a hit from Mewtwo. Unfortunately, you won't KO him, but it will allow you to bring in something like Ladybug, who can survive a hit and finish the job. Once Ho-Oh is in, allow Ladybug to go down, and then bring out Coffee. Coughing should survive an earthquake, but sometimes will go down and you'll need to restart here. When he doesn't, Explosion should get close, but not fully take down ho -Oh. Don't rush the next phase. Try to stall out all the Sacred Fires that ho -Oh has left, swapping between Tentacle and Chikorita. If you're lucky, you'll be able to take it down with Chikorita once it's out of Sacred Fires, and it is required since nothing on our team outspeeds him. Once you're done with ho -Oh, you'll likely only have Chikorita and Magnemite left, and Chikorita will go down immediately. Magnemite has access to Thunder, which can miss, and possibly deal less than half of Lugia's HP. But, with just enough luck, you'll take Lugia down in two hits, which is all the time Magnemite will have before going down itself. After retrying a bunch and strategizing, I finally got an attempt that took him down, and finished Stadium 2, except I'm weak. And except that the game has an entire reduct of everything you've done so far. This is called Round 2. At this point, I have no plans currently of doing round 2, as this run took an enormous amount of time, and I'm not certain I'm ready to start another 2 plus year run for round 2. This run was extremely long and very frustrating, and if you want to do it yourself, I highly recommend easing the rules in various places. But for now, I'm proud of how far I was able to take it and happy to finally finish round 1. If you enjoyed this run, please consider dropping a like, comment, or follow, as I have more coming to this channel soon. If you're interested in seeing these done live, I stream all my runs on Twitch, where I showcase each run before we know if they're possible. I'm Glitch the Box Links, and I'll see you in the next Out of the Box Challenge.